welcome back everyone, it's me again, Matt. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for joining me on today's video. Main battle tanks of Russia, they're quite confusing sometimes really, aren't they? Especially to the untrained eye, if you're not aware of the subtle differences between main battle tanks of the Soviet Union or Russia, it can be a little confusing. Even to this day, I struggle to verify what tanks what, uh, because I forget what those little subtle differences are. And this tank is no exception to that very strange oddity when it comes to verifying what tank is which from the Russian nation. Of course, uh, the T-62 is no exception to that rule, and today we are talking about this beautiful medium tank that was born from the need to upgrade or replace the aging T-54-55 series in order for Soviet tanks to be more able to defeat their new Western counterparts in battle. This tank's 115mm smoothbore gun was a notable upgrade over the earlier 100mm rifled D-10T gun. The competition, the D-54TS rifle gun, lingered on for a while thanks to its newly developed tungsten core sub-caliber rounds. But once these became available for the U-5TS smoothbore as well, the D-54TS finally disappeared from all future tank proposals. Originally, the T-62 was supposed to be a stopgap measure before the appearance of the newer T-64 tank from Kharkov, but in the end, it was produced in the Soviet Union until 1975 with more than 20 thousand of these tanks made, and it formed the backbone of the Soviet forces for many years to come. Unlike the T-64 later on, the T-62 was released for export quite soon. After all, it was scheduled to be replaced anyway. In the end, over 5,000 of these tanks were actually exported around the world, and still to this day fighting away. Interestingly enough, most Warsaw Pact countries were not keen on actually purchasing this vehicle. There are rumours going around on the internet about the T-62 being license produced in Czechoslovakia or Poland, but as far as I can find, this seems like more of a myth. This vehicle was not produced in either country. This misinformation probably comes from Western sources and is unfortunately mentioned by Steven Zagola as well. Both countries evaluated it, but the vehicle was actually quite expensive. The price of an imported T-62 was roughly 50% more of that of the T-55. The other thing was that the Warsaw Pact militaries knew very well that the Soviets themselves were preparing to replace this vehicle and buy more expensive tanks that were considered only temporary, which was considered totally a waste of money. In the end, the T-62s were generally only exported to Arab countries to replace the heavy losses from wars with Israel. Cuba, some African countries also, and Vietnam, along with, of course, North Korea, that actually produced its own variant up until the 80s. One very peculiar case was a Damansk incident from March 1969, where Soviet forces lost a T-62 that drowned in a river during fighting with the Chinese. The Chinese troops were able to recover the lost tank, and the technology salvaged from it were used to significantly advance their own tank developments. The T-62 took part in several notable conflicts. During the Yom Kippur War with Israel, Arab tankers managed to cause some losses to their Israeli counterparts. But in the end, the Israeli training prevailed, and the Centurions managed to destroy dozens upon dozens of Syrian and Egyptian T-62 tanks. Despite the massive Arab losses, the Israelis did consider the T-62 to be a very lethal and very formidable enemy, and used a number of captured T-62 themselves under the designation of the Turan. Another major conflict for the T-62 that it was taken part in was, of course, the Afghanistan War, where it proved to be extremely vulnerable to ambushes and mines, and the Soviets lost 385 T-62 tanks throughout the entire conflict. Nevertheless, the T-62 continued to be a very popular choice, and hundreds remain in service at various parts of the world today. But, like the T-54-55 before it, by the 1970s and 1980s, the vehicle was already showing its extreme signs of age. Its steel armour was the first to become very, very obsolete. With its 100mm of steel, albeit sloped, the vehicle offered very little frontal protection from modern missiles, such as the American tow system that started appearing in the early 1970s. The turret was quite thick for its time, 242mm in the front and the latter batches, but it was still just steel. The gun needed an upgrade too. Not that it was completely obsolete, but the fire control system definitely could use an upgrade. There was many stories of gunners trying to use the fire control system and it taking far too long to actually program and operate. The tank, for example, did not have a proper rangefinder, and the gun only used its telescopic TSH-2B41, later the TSH-S-41, 
41U gun sights with an inbuilt scale to estimate the distance to his target. The tank had a very formidable engine for its uh, class and time. The engine was a classic V55V diesel engine producing only around 580 horsepower, but enough to keep the tank chugging along at a fairly respectable place off-road and on-road in the tank lineup of the day. In short, in the early 1980s though, it was decided that modernization was needed to significantly improve the combat value of thousands of T-62 tanks that were still in service. However, that's not to say that there were no upgrades between the launch of this tank in production in 1965 and its end in 1975, but these upgrades were only partial. It had improved engine decks, improved tracks and improved drive sprockets in the model 1967. Returning the heavy 12.7mm anti-aircraft machine gun mount to the vehicle on the model 1972, the KTD-1 laser rangefinder in the model 1975, and the mesh anti-RPG additional armor based on the Afghanistan experiences. And there were also lots of other smaller changes. A more thorough modernization though was needed and the result became the T-62M. The most visible change was the armor upgrade. Its goal was to significantly improve the tank's protection from guided missiles and heat shells in general. The frontal hull and frontal turret received a major armor upgrade, identical in composition of the one of the T-55M called BDD armor. The armor was quite interesting. It consisted of 3 cm of steel plate and 8 cm of space, filled with 4 angled layered 5 mm steel plates and layers of polyurethane. The turret armor was identically improved in the most exposed zones by what was become known as Iliax eyebrows, which were basically two thick stripes of armor. Although the frontal protection increased to approximately 450 to 400 millimeters of rolled homogenous armor versus heat and 320 millimeters of rolled homogenous armor versus kinetic shells, the whole kit version weighed little over two tons. The T-62M also received an anti-radiation liner, and a MU anti-heat rubber screen were installed on the sides of the vehicles, although this feature was optional and many vehicles lacked it. But at least not the most important part of the entire upgrade was the frontal part or the lower front plate weld to the second pair of road wheels which received an additional 20mm of armour as an anti-mine protection system, which for the most part past its Afghanistan years really made no huge sense. There was no real guerrilla warfare required against this tank anymore and it came back to the old Cold War era style of attack. Some additional defensive measures included the 902B Tuka smoke grenade launcher system, the Soda anti-napalm system, and the firepower was improved by the introduction of two major improvements, the 9K116-2 Skenschner missile launching system and the Volna fire control system. The Skessna missile system was actually allowing the vehicle to fire the 9M117 missiles, the same missiles fired by the T-55M's Bastion system. The missile was capable of penetrating up to 750mm of steel. The minimum range was 100m and the maximum range was around 4000m, and the average velocity of this missile was around 370m a second. The Volna fire control system consisted of the following components, an improved KTD-2 laser rangefinder, the BV-62 ballistic computer and the TSHS M41U gun sight along with the Meteor M1 stabilizer. As you can see, some of the components were identical to that of the Volna FCS version of the T-55M. The unification was important as a cost saver, although the 9M117 missiles themselves were extremely expensive for a weapon system of this kind and really made no true sense to fire it considering the cost of the tank and main gun rounds being used. The 115mm smoothbore gun also received a thermal shroud to prevent it from twisting by the heat of the fire. Additionally, some models had the anti-aircraft 12.7mm DSHAKM machine gun replaced by the more modern NSVT. One of the key things that you can notice about the T-62 difference between the T-55 and 54 is the fume extractor on the barrel. You can also notice that the spacing between the wheels is a little different on the T-54 and 55 models. However, some tanks out there have had certain modifications that deceive you in those two key attributes of defining between what is a T-62 and a T-55. Really, really difficult considering the way in which tanks around the world have been modified in their own variants and the way in which they've kind of just been changed to whatever country they want them to be as. The engine was replaced also by a more powerful 620 horsepower V55U, although the maximum speed 
surprisingly didn't actually change and remained the same as the 50 km an hour did before. The tracks were also improved further, they were unified with the T72 ones. The communications were also modernised as well. The R123 radio was replaced with the more modern R173 set. Of course, with any Russian vehicle, there are many different variants and subversions of this tank, along with many other tank platforms out there of Soviet and Russian design. Some notable mentions are the T62 M 1, which was a tank with the improved V46 5M engine, which produced an impressive 690 horsepower, and also the T62 MV 1, which is the T62 MV with an improved V46 5M engine. And finally, the T62MV, which is basically a T62M without adding the additional BDD armor, but instead an explosive reactive armor kit. It's worth noting that the T62D prototype series, which were T62 tanks equipped with the experimental DROZ APS or active protection system, are not subtypes of the T62M. The development actually ran in parallel to this tank, although the T62MD prototype, which was a T62M equipped with the DRODS APS, actually existed. The exact number of vehicles modified is completely unknown because there are so many different variants. One plant alone modified around 400 T62s to the standards that are passed on from the T62D and M variants but the number of produced is totally, totally different to what I could find, uh, and it's likely that it was in its low thousands. The T-62Ms weren't that widely exported either. Many appeared in Afghanistan during the Soviet-Afghan war and were supplied to the local governments. Later, they appeared during conflicts in Chechnya, and most recently a number of those tanks were sold to Syria, where they were used quite successfully against anti-government forces. Some of the T-62 main battle tank equipment was carried over directly from the T-55. The torsion bar suspension and hydraulic shock absorbers were similar to that of the T-55 suspension system. It also had the fire suppression system that could be manually activated or automatically through heat sensors on the vehicle. The vehicle did have nuclear, biological and radiological protection systems that were automatically able to seal the tank at preset levels of radiation if they were encountered. The T-62 does use standard Soviet smokescreen equipment using diesel fuel sprayed onto the exhaust manifold. In the normal configuration, the T-62 could ford rivers up to 4.6 feet deep. When a snorkel was fitted, 8 hour procedure in that, it could candle up to around 15 feet of water in wading. Now, the turret, surprisingly, couldn't be traversed during the loading sequence. This combination of drawbacks made it very vulnerable during the Yom Kippur War and the invasion of Lebanon. Only 40 rounds of the main gun were actually carried. The machine gun carried around 3,000 rounds coaxially, which helped a little bit when engaging infantry in Afghanistan. Overall, folks, the T-62 was a very impressive tank for its time, but unfortunately, as it being just a stopgap vehicle, it never really was able to match the superiority of the T-64 and later T-72 tanks. It was basically a less desirable main battle tank, as everybody was waiting for the next model. Almost like when you just bought the older iPhone model for the one that's just about to come out and you think, well, I'll save a bit of money and get the one that's just before it. I don't need the fancy bells and whistles. But unfortunately, uh, the bells and whistles of the T-64 did make this vehicle a little less uh, than desired, especially in its armor configuration. Overall, though, the vehicle did quite well in its service. You know, it performed through as to what it was supposed to do. Uh, the various upgrades did give it a little bit more capability, but for the most part, the tank just wasn't suited to going up against other tanks. It was more suited in supporting infantry more than anything else. Uh, and in Afghanistan, it was definitely very vulnerable to guerrilla-style warfare and, you know, IED slash mine attack. So I hope you enjoyed today's video, folks. Please leave me a like if you did enjoy the video. Uh, thank you to everyone who has been contributing towards my Patreon lately. It really does mean a lot. I know a lot of you have been uh, donating towards that page lately, and it really does mean a lot on every single level, personally, for me, for you to do that. Um, it's supporting me getting new things to produce content for you guys, so thank you so much. Um, I also have my Facebook and Discord links in the bottom there and other links that you can go check out. Um, if you do want to be notified of any upcoming videos, please make sure you click the little bell by the subscribe button so you can get a bit of an idea when I release some new videos. Thank you again for stopping by and I will see you next time. All the best everyone. Bye bye.